But just imagine if, in a few days' time, Daniel Khalif pitched up at a press conference, sat next to the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran in Tehran. Imagine the embarrassment for the UK, for the government, the prison service, the police, all of whom have a degree of embarrassment anyway over this. That would be absolutely catastrophic. The UK would be the laughing stock of the Western world. The search for escaped terror suspect Daniel Khalif is now into its fourth day, with police helicopters searching southwest London again overnight. He broke out of Wandsworth Prison on Wednesday, strapping himself to the underside of a food delivery lorry. Well, a close relative has urged Khalif to hand himself in, speaking exclusively to the Times. They described the former soldier as a very, very intelligent and easygoing and kind boy, but said he'd changed in the past year. So, how do you conduct a manhunt? We can speak with two people who know. We've got former Chief Constable of Northumbria Police, Sue Sim, who led the manhunt of Raoul Moat in 2010, who he went on the run for seven days after killing one person and wounding two others. It was the largest operation in modern history. Uh, Sue, good morning to you. Good morning, Callum. Good to have you on the programme. And also here, former Metropolitan Police Detective Peter Blexley, a founder member of Scotland Yard's Undercover Unit. Peter, good morning. Good morning. It's great to have you both. Uh, thank you both for joining us. Um, Sue, first of all, we can start with you. Uh, here we are now several days on into this manhunt. Has the, has the key moment passed? Is he now on the run for the foreseeable? How important have these last couple of days been? Well, I've been very surprised that we haven't actually had many more sightings. And one of the things that I've been uh, quite disappointed in, actually, is the lack of, of um, urgent from the Metropolitan to find this man. You know, one of the key things when we had um, notes on the run was that uh, we kept, we had an extensive communication strategy we had an extensive media strategy where I was appealing to both Moat to hand himself in. I was also appealing to everybody in the areas and across the country using the media to really make sure that anybody who had seen this man was reporting things in. I believe the Met is saying they've only had about 100 people phoning in at the moment, that is very, very disappointing mm. and probably due to the fact that the Met hasn't really advertised this as well as they probably should have done. So, Peter Blexley here. Um, down here in the great metropolis, <laughs> the Met have been really very vocal and they've been pretty frequently propping, popping up uh, in the media. In fact, the head of the counterterrorism team who's leading the hunt for Khalif actually thanked the media quite effusively for all the assistance that they've been giving down here. So I'm just wondering perhaps if the messaging has not got out nationally mm. as it should have done, but it's certainly been broadly covered down here. But as you know, Peter, one of the things that when you're running an inquiry like this, what you actually want is people from all over the country who may have links with him in, in other elements of his life who could know information. And certainly the only thing that we're seeing is, yes, it's, it's on the news, but we're not being asked anything up here at all. Mm. Which is interesting because, of course, in the early stages of the inquiry, the police did say quite clearly that he had contacts, to, contacts in the northwest of the country. And, of course, he'd served in the army many, many miles north of the Watford Gap. So maybe there's some credence to what you're saying here. So. Can I ask as well, Peter, just in terms of the last sort of 12 to 18 hours or so and the developments that we've seen. So uh, the first sighting has been sort of reported and picked up on by police. There's now a reward of up to £20,000 for information leading to his arrest. And the front page of the Times today is a family member encouraging him to hand himself in. Are you getting any feeling at all that the net is closing? I suspect this sighting, which the Met have confirmed, was Khalif exiting from underneath the lorry, will be regarded as very significant, and it might actually be almost the start point for this inquiry, because it's confirmed. So what they will do from there, bearing in mind it was on Wandsworth Roundabout, which is an enormous roundabout for anybody who's not familiar with it. It's where arterial roads come together. It's vast. 
Um, and personally, if I was a fugitive, I wouldn't have used that as an exit point to come out from the vehicle purely because of the volume of traffic and therefore the very mm. high likelihood of you being spotted, which, of course, mm. is exactly what has happened. Use that as a start point to then pan out your CCTV search all the systems from there to try and then get a direction of travel in the hope that they can shorten this time gap. If you look at it now as some four days, treat that as a piece of string. What you're trying to do is shorten that piece of string by going from one sighting to another sighting to another sighting, all the time closing the time gap between you and the fugitive. I'm interested to hear from both of you, and Sue, maybe you want to pick up on this first. Do you believe that he was helped? I mean, obviously, the Metropolitan Police are looking at the the fact that maybe it was an inside job, um, and clearly it was pre-planned, is what we're told, by the head of the Met. Do you think he's got help on the outside or indeed the inside? Sue first. I, I genuinely believe that um, this has been a very well-organised escape. Um, I'm not saying, and I wouldn't accuse any prison officers of uh, being involved, that will be for the investigation to determine. I would say that this has absolutely had an element of organisation. You cannot simply disappear into thin air, even if you're a member of the military with military training. So I do believe that there are people who are assisting him. And that's why I still go back to the fact that you really, they really do need to be uh, ramping up mm. the um, way that people can communicate with the Met. Telling people to phone 999, which is all that they're doing at the moment, a lot of people won't phone 999 unless they believe they are in danger. Um, I can't understand why they're, they're not asking, why they haven't established um, a communication number directly into the team so that um, they can gather information. They're more likely to get support from the public if they do that. Sue, it's normally me that's got my size 12s up the rear end of various <laughs> police services, and I'm quite happy to see you've taken on my mantle this morning. Um, but you raise a really valid point. There hasn't as yet been issued a specific telephone number for members of the public who might be reluctant to dial 999, so there is no alternative to that at the moment. And, of course, I will reiterate that the police have said quite firmly, do not approach this man should mm. you see him, mm. but just pick up the phone and ring 999. Mm. Do you think he's being helped? Well, there was definitely an element of planning within the prison walls. That we know, because somehow he sourced or adapted these straps because, of course, Alex Chalk, the Justice Secretary, told the House of Commons on Thursday they were found on the underneath of the lorry. So there's an element of planning within the prison walls. I think the big concern will be, was there planning outside of the prison walls? In other words, was there somebody, is there somebody with that archetypical grab bag with clothes, food, cash, documents, maybe a passport? If there was, that could be quite catastrophic. And I might be accused of over-egging this, but just imagine if, in a few days' time, Daniel Khalif pitched up at a press conference, sat next to the supreme leader of the Islamic Republic of Iran in Tehran. Imagine the embarrassment for the UK, for the government, the prison service, the police, all of whom have a degree of embarrassment anyway over this. That would be absolutely catastrophic. The UK would be the laughing stock of the Western world. Mm. So... I'm sure many, many people are hoping that that's not going to be the scenario and it might be a very, very extreme type of example for me to set, but that could be a possibility. But I'm hoping that he's living on his wits, flying by the seat of his pants, making it up as he goes along and essentially doesn't have that outside assistance because if that is the case and he's resorting to scavenging in bins and the like then the likelihood of him being captured is, is far greater. Sue, what gets in the way of a police operation like this, based on your experience? What are the, what are the hurdles that actually slow down progress in catching somebody? Well, actually, the location that he's gone missing is a, is a huge uh, problem. 
because when we had uh, Moat going missing, of course, he went to ground up in uh, the beautiful area of Northumberland at Cragside, which was um, fantastic in one way because there weren't that many people around there, but in another way it posed its own problems. But actually, the, the fact that he's gone missing in the city, in the city, people tend to be minding their own business, um, they tend to not be looking around them, they tend not to be interested, which is why I go back to the point that you really need to get this man's face all over the place. Mm. You need to be appealing to the public far more than you're doing at the moment. You need to be getting out the dedicated phone numbers. You need to be uh, really, really making sure that the public are checking up on absolutely everybody. Peter, give us an insight into his possible state of mind based on others who have gone on the run. You saying there about, you know, living by the seat of his pants at this point is an option if he's not being helped or whatever. But actually, how is somebody in this crisis panic situation, how is their brain actually functioning? Well, of course, this is a man with military training. Mm. He was only in the army for three or four years and he certainly didn't get to the lofty heights of working in special forces, for example, like the Special Boat Service or the SAS. So he's not an elite soldier, but he's got a degree of training. So he sits somewhere between <coughs> Joe Public and the elite of the military. He sits somewhere in, in between those two. And that, of course, will be of some assistance to him. We know he's resourceful. We know he's quite imaginative, purely by virtue of how he got out of Wandsworth Prison. So how strong is his resolve? We shall have to see. That will largely depend on whether he's eating, sleeping. Mm. The weather's been very, very favourable to a fugitive down here for the last few days. So he's not going to be cold, wet and shivering, which unfortunately all plays into his into his favour. Um, so we shall have to see. It will be dictated to by his surroundings, by what he's consuming and whether he's getting any time to rest. Mm. I wonder how long the police can keep up this intensity yeah. of an investigation. Could this go on for weeks or months? Presumably not. Well, again, policing, they will tell you, is all about resources. So if there were to be some catastrophic kind of incident, and let's sincerely hope there won't be, that might take precedence. It's as simple as that. They don't have a never-ending set of police officers that they can just open another box and pull another load out. Their resources are finite. There are other investigations and duties and roles that have to be fulfilled. So they'll keep throwing everything at it, though, because remember, my Tehran scenario, which I've imagined, of course, if that were to happen, so many heads would roll, not only in the prison service, not only in policing, but at ministerial level. Mm. So in your experience... The other you... thing... Sorry, I was going to ask you your uh, uh, reflection. Go on. The the other thing that I was going to say is don't forget that the, um, the search part is only a relatively small part of this investigation. There'll also be um, a huge investigative strategy ongoing where you will have um, them looking at what he was doing before he left the prison. You will be looking at uh, a, a huge in, um, intelligence strategy and with the intelligence capability of the MET and the counterterrorism units, they will be deploying everything to uh, their best efforts to allow the search to be directed in a meaningful manner. But the big issue is for the public to look around them, to see anything that's unusual that may relate to this man, and at the moment call 999 to report it. I just, it's so fascinating speaking to you both. Uh, Sue, I want to ask how you deal with fear in communities where... Uh, the people there may be just anxious that this is happening near them. I know people in southwest London who have jokingly, but with an undertone of trepidation over the last couple of days, said, oh, make sure the back door is locked, you know, double lock it, etc. Et Genuinely just a bit concerned that if this man is in this area of London, then they are at risk. How do you approach fear in communities when somebody's on the run like this? 
Well, you do that through your communication. I know right. yeah. I, I sound like an old thing <laughs> saying about communication. But the other thing that they should have out is they should have uh, all their uh, foot police. And I, I don't know what it's like down there at the moment, Peter, whether uh, you don't see foot police, but they should have the uni uniform colleagues out there reassuring the public mm. about uh, the fact that this man isn't dangerous. So they've said, make sure that uh, they just reiterate assets and provide support to the communities as they can. Yeah. We had uh, who had killed a member of the public who we knew and, and the way that we got out into the communities reassured them as best we could visible support to the communities themselves was as important as the um, search strategies and the investigative strategies as yeah, well. Of course, visible police presence on the streets of London, there's a rare thing. Uh, Peter, just <laughs> as we bring this to a conclusion, what what is your hunch? Where do you think he is? It will all boil down to, was the planning confined to within the prison walls or was it outside of the prison walls? If it's outside of the prison walls, then all bets are off, anything could happen. If it was within the prison walls, they're going to find him. Sue, have you got a hunch? I think they'll find him. I think he will be uh, somewhere within the country still. Uh, I do agree with Peter that the worst case would be that if he turned up in uh, mm. Tehran. But I, I still think that um, we, the, the Metropolitan were made aware of it uh, sufficiently quickly to stop him getting out of the country at this point. Mm. Thank you both so much for your time this morning. Really insightful, uh, really grateful to you. Uh, heard there from Sue Sim, former Chief Constable of Northumbria Police. She led that manhunt for Raoul Moat in 2010. And uh, also here in the studio, former Metropolitan Police Detective Peter Blexley, founder member of Scotland Yard's Undercover Unit.